Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka and I'm the director of the museum. In the domain of been there, done that, our speaker today certainly qualifies as a charter member. He's no stranger to the domain of tough assignments either. In this season of jack-o'-lanterns, ghosts, and zombies, nothing from any costume shop promises to be as hair-raising as some of the exploits that became routine tasks for the pilots who flew these extraordinary missions. Please sit comfor comfortably at the edge of your seats while we welcome Bob Cashman. Thank you very much. The uh, business of directing artillery fire is really kind of fun. How many of you here have, have been on the ground when a, a significant artillery piece was fired off? Yeah, it, it's so loud, it's unbelievable. Uh, almost instantly, you have a hearing problem. Uh, you could report in for sick bay right then after one shot and probably qualify. This is an L-19. Cessna built about 3,000 of these. They're an incredible airplane. They're a modification of a Cessna 170, which you see on this field here, I'm sure. This is the interior of the airplane. If you look at it, it's the old, old, old style gyro. Uh, this is the left wing route of this airplane. Uh, this is a pretty modern one. If you'll notice the red switches up here. After we had a lot of trouble talking people into targets, and I'll talk about that, they added uh, some white phosphorus rockets. And it takes two switches to fire a rocket. You one arm the rocket and one to fire the rocket. Uh, it also had some uh, flares to light up the ground. It fires out, has a little parachute on it, and it burns for about four minutes. And it lights up the ground so you can see what's going on down there to figure out who to send the guns after. Uh, the air artillery spotter is really the baddest guy in the theater. And of course, he then becomes the top target in the theater. Here's an L-19 in Korea. And get a look at the uh, hillside, look at the terrain. This is why it's very difficult to teach a guy to figure out where he's at from looking at the ground or looking at the maps or putting the combination together. They all look the same and there's almost no roads. Bridges, roads and so forth really didn't exist uh, of any consequence. So it's very difficult to tell which is our guys and which is their guys and whose hill is which. If you look at Korea, the middle of the country is right across here and that's our demilitarized zone. Within the, uh, the little figure eights are airports. We had to locate ourselves close to an Air Force airport to get fuel. We got our fuel in a little two-wheel trailer and we'd uh, pump it out with a little hand pump, a wobble pump. MiG Alley up in the top is where you hear all about the F-86s fighting the MiGs and the line right across here is north of there is China. The Chinese stayed on their side of the line, but they resupplied everything. So there are large ammunition dumps just across the river. And the Navy and the Air Force patrolled that river very carefully. This area here was full of ships and there was activity on the ground all the time between the Royal Marines sneaking in at night and blowing things up. And, and it just, they just kept everything stirred up all the time. Bottom line is uh, we came in here, right down here, and that airport looks like this. And this is a real bunch of cats and dog airplanes. This is an L-5 uh, Stinson, which was a very common airplane. There's another one right here. Down there is another L-5. Down here is an L-17, which is a Navion. And a cup over here is a Piper, or a, uh, it's one of the L-23 or 4 series. That was the aviation equipment at the time we got there. Uh, there was literally none. We brought the first L-19s to Korea, and it was a huge, giant step to give us the time over the target or the range. This is the guns that were in my outfit. We were the 402nd Field Artillery of the 45th Division. We had self-propelled 155 millimeter guns, had 16 of them. We had 42 trucks and five Jeeps and uh, some other minor equipment, not of any consequence. About 40 radios, uh, which became very important. This is our first deployment of these guns. Uh, they had been brought ashore at Incheon and were stored at Incheon, and we went and got them and brought them over and brought them into, the, uh, into a position. They are in a firing position here. They, they moved up about 100 yards from here and actually were firing. The terrain behind us, uh, this is what they call the Iron Triangle, that whole series of uh, battles that you heard about, Heartbreak Ridge, Sandcastle, uh, Porkchop Hill, 
That whole string is right there. That's the range of mountains. That's what they looked like. Uh, the only decent flat area is where we were, right there. Uh, and we, we built that into an airport. The next assignment for me was the airport at Suwon. And this was a class act. It had tents with wood floors. And uh, here we are, our unit was arriving. We don't have a picture of the, the airport, but there was nothing on the airport except five L-19s at that point. We had problems with fuel because the fuel was lousy and it had water in it and we had to pour it out through into jerry cans through a, to, through a, uh, a chamois skin and then you'd take it and then you'd rinse the chamois skin and then you'd pour it back into another jerry can and you'd still pick up water and you'd do that three, four times to get the water out of it so we could bring the planes up. And this is a group that was from uh, Merced, California. Uh, this is a rifle company and you can see that they're pretty well equipped. Some brilliant soul back at the Pentagon figured out that the 39th Division was on the line and had been there for well over a year, and the 40th Division was to come in and replace them. The 45th Division did replace the 38th Division, which was on the left or the uh, west side of, the, of, this, the, of these mountains where I was. The, in their brilliance, they figured out that, gee whiz, the rifle, the, all the infantrymen could keep their weapons and stuff. And the uh, 40th was in Japan. The 40th was in Japan, 30, already loaded with all its equipment and in full strength. So they said, gee whiz, we'll let the 38th uh, leave their equipment there, and the 40th will leave their equipment in Japan and just trade the personnel back and forth, and we won't have to haul that stuff around. Uh, brilliant idea by somebody who wasn't around because the reality was the 40th got there and the 38th didn't have any equipment. It had all been destroyed, used up, worn out. Of their radios, they only had seven that worked, uh, which would be almost impossible to get anything to work. Of their field pieces, their, unit, their uh, guns were one, 105 millimeter howitzers. Nearly all of them had no tires. Uh, were not movable, they were there, but you couldn't do much with them. Uh, they had no ammunition, they, they literally used up everything. And they didn't have good winter weather. So the 45th, which was, a f which was a wealthy division by the standards at that time, was merged together with the two. And uh, Ridgway himself came down and engineered this, and he reassigned the people, and he fired the general uh, that was in charge of that whole operation and uh, replaced him, and uh, that way the 40th got some decent equipment. The clothing that they're wearing came from the 45th, and we were kind of glad to give it to them because a white uniform meant that you're gonna go up to the front. And if they want my white uniform, here it is, guys, no problem. <laughs> there is a 40th Division with a 45th Division gun, manned by 40th Division guys, going into position just at the bottom of the Iron Triangle. And uh, you can see the size of the bullets. The uh, thing is such that you can unscrew the top and dump out little powder bags inside. And the powder bags are numbered one to nine. And the firing order, depending on how far you wanted to shoot and what you were, the way you were shooting it, you'd put in the right number of bags or the right numbered bags and then screw the lid back on. Then you had a fuse and you could set the fuse either to go off in seconds from the time of firing or at an altitude, depending on the kind of fuse you had. Some of them, we had both kinds, but the ones that were firing at altitude didn't work. The way you got your ammunition was really modern. Uh, these were Republic of Korea troops that we sort of drafted for the job, and they're carrying two shells. Each shell weighed about 80 pounds, so each guy's carrying about 160 pounds. The reason they're walking is because there's no road. The Army, when it first went there, the 39th that we came in and replaced had mules, but the mules kept disappearing. And, and it, they figured out finally that the guys were, they were stealing them and eating them. Here we are airdropping uh, ammunition into uh, the same thing. These are 105 millimeter shells we're dropping in here uh, in support of a different unit than the one I just showed you. This is just over the hill, that first hill that you see in the rise there. It was, it was not an easy place to get to, but we, we, we had a hell of a time getting the guns over the hills. But once they were in position, then we armed them pretty well, and then we could f supply them with it by air. This is taken from my plane looking down with a K-20 camera, uh, the aerial camera. And the film is five and a half inches wide, 
and 56 feet long. And you would wind it up with a spring and then you would, you could automatically, you could shoot a series of films until the spring came unwound and you wound it up again. It's a little bit of an illusion because we were at about 5,000 feet and the planes, which were C-119s, dropped that at about 2,500 feet. So they were almost 2,000 feet below us, although it doesn't look it. The general headquarters for the military or the Army uh, and the Air Force, actually the entire UN operations was at Osan, Korea. Osan was uh, 150 miles south of the demilitarized line uh, and we were flying around the hills and this was taken out that left window of the airplane. Uh, the idea of it was to show the railroad track which is down underneath there uh, because there was, a, there was a double track railroad from Pusan to Seoul. And that was our main navigating device. We followed that railroad track up. If you got lost, you headed east or west and they hit the track or the water, one or the other. And then you knew pretty well where you were. Uh, and then you'd start figuring out where you wanted to go because uh, everything looked the same and you could get lost trying to go home uh, in these, these trips. On that point, we had a directional finding radio on the airport uh, and it moved with us. It was. Uh, and it broadcast a, sim, a signal on about the 200 megahertz band, just above the broadcast band, which is where our communications radio were. And we had a round loop in the top of the airplane, and you could actually reach up and turn the loop, or the, some of the later models had, a, had a, a cable from there back to the middle of the back of the airplane to turn, to turn that loop. And you'd look for the null where the, the loop would go. It'd either be a strong signal or a weak signal, depending on the, the way the loop was pointed. You'd put it on the strong signal, then you'd turn the radio down to where you could just barely hear it, and if the signal went away, you're going away from the station. If it got louder, you're headed to the station. And that's the way we got home. Uh, and that was a fairly common practice at that time, even among airlines. The telephone wires are the other point. As soon as a artillery unit lands somewhere, plants its feet, they run a telephone line somewhere. Well, the somewhere is a fire control center, which is out in the middle of those guns. The fire control center is a usually has a lieutenant or two who take the orders from the fire from the combat information center and triangulate it into headings and directions to fire the guns. The guns were kind of tricky because when you plant a gun on the ground you have to figure out where you are and where you want to shoot. The first thing you have to do is line it up on some known place and you have a bubble or a level to level the gun and uh, it's a it's a completely, so you level it all directions when you level the gun. So once it's level, then you could line it up with your compass to get your north, and you could theoretically then walk it around from things. In artillery school, they taught us that you line up outside the city and pick the church steeple. Line up on the church steeple, and, and you then knew, because it's marked on all the maps, and you could then in turn figure out exactly what you could do. You could walk it over from the church steeple, in 100 yard units, not shooting, but in ma mathematics, to where you'd be lined up on the road or the bridge or whatever it is, which is your default target. Whenever a gun stops, it, it sights in a default target. So if everything goes to hell, you, you can fire immediately and blow something up that's going to be a threat to you. And the threats were the bridges or these little passes through the mountains or things like that. The problem is there are no church steeples in Korea. <laughs> If there was a one in the entire country, by the time we got there, the guys had already blown it up. Uh, and the, the, neither, the Buddhists weren't into religion, the North, North Koreans and Chinese, they're another world. There were no church steeples. In fact, there's nothing to line up on, nothing to, to coordinate your gun, so you're gonna know where the doggone shell shoots. Well, this, this group, we thought we were pros because we're the 45th, you know, we're the experts. That's artillery school is at Fort Sill in our territory, right? The 40th guys came out. And some of you may know or may have known, he just recently died, Gil Ferguson, who was our bird colonel in the 40th. Colonel Ferguson with the Eagle was from Orange County. Uh, he was part of the uh, Santa Ana triple nickel uh, 105 millimeter artillery unit. He wasn't too familiar with the 155s. He'd never worked with them, but then again, he's a colonel, so he knows everything. The, uh, we set the gun up, and we, fire, we got ready to fire it, and Lieutenant McDonald, who became a close friend of mine, uh, took off and went out to look for the impact. And we'd find an impact point, and then we'd build everything off of that impact point. 
So they set the gun up and they loaded it and they fired it. And McDonald is up there and he says, no impact, no sight, didn't see it, nothing happened. Did the gun fire? Well, oh, must have misfired. So they got some sandbags, put them up, put about a 150 foot rope on the breech of the gun, went back behind the sandbags, pulled it and opened it up, it's gone. The bullet had fired. So he said, what the hell happened? Well, he started trying to put two and two together and about that time a Jeep drives up with, with three Brits. Uh, and one of them also had, a, pair, uh, had an, uh, a senior officer. They had different kind of symbols, but he uh, made it very clear that he was ranking over Mr. Ferguson. In any event, uh, they pushed the numbers from uh, 001 to, to 100. So instead of firing almost straight north, they fired almost straight east. Well, it wound up on the bank of a river just across from the, from the British uh, Artillery Center. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, there was some heated discussion. And uh, we were uh, close enough to hear some of the discussion and it, it was really pretty good. This, this, this uh, British uh, officer was very, very uh, loquacious. Uh, <laughs> in any event, uh, they learned something from that. Uh, Ferguson, uh, in his defense, uh, got uh, his real world job was with the Irvine Company as a public relations guy. He was a publisher of the Irvine World News and some things like that. So he knew the right people. He contacted his boss, who contacted uh, the governor, Earl Warren, who is technically the commander of our National Guard. And he flew to Korea and met with, with Ferguson and was there, and I saw Earl Warren at that time. And he was telling him about the flight of their division with no equipment and they couldn't get any response from the military and they couldn't get anything anywhere. And he went from Korea to Washington, Earl Warren, who later became a uh, judge. And uh, he got the dam broke and all of a sudden they got all kinds of equipment and then we had more stuff than we even wanted, uh, which was kind of fantastic because we were very short of shells, very short of ammunition. Uh, countermanding uh, standing order, General Van Fleet, who was our, who was our direct inline commander, uh, gave us the authority to fire at will if we had targets of opportunity. Here's a target of opportunity. It was just beyond the range of our guns. We had one radio frequency, one radio and one radio frequency. We would in turn contact with our fire control center, which was the unit right at the, at the guns. They in turn had a telephone line over to the Combat Information Center uh, and the Combat Information Center monitored our frequency all the time. And they in turn, we'd see a uh, gun and they were our initial contact point is the Combat Information Center, uh, CIC. And uh, we think it stood for Christ I'm Confused. <laughs> but it, it, they were the contact to us uh, on everything and both our fire control center and combat information center and sometimes the Navy and the Air Force were all monitoring it to see what's going on out there. Well this one time we caught a, an ammunition dump and we caught them on the ground with, with, their, with their trucks. Those are all Chinese trucks. Trucks are very scarce and there were very few tr people that could even drive them in the North Korean and Chinese armies. Uh, and they only carried ammunition. All troops walked and they carried their own food. The uh, Combat Information Center contacted the Air Force and these guys were coming back from up around the Mig Alley area and they vectored him in to us and then he came over on my frequency and I talked him into the target and that's taken with the K-20 camera out of the L-19. He got the uh, ammunition dump and they turned around, there were two of them, there's two F-80s or P-80s we called them then. There were two of those and the other guy came in and machine gunned the trucks and we got them all. Every single truck got, got they, as soon as you hit a truck with a bullet from the machine gun, they'd, they'd explode because they're all carrying ammunition. This is just over the hill at Iron Triangle. Uh, they were coming in and refueling or resupplying the guys that we were looking across the hill from. The good thing about being an artillery guy is generally you don't fly out beyond the range of your guns because there's no reason to find a target out there because you can't get it. So it, it's a degree of safety because if you're at 10,000 feet in an L-19, you can glide 10 miles. Uh, so you've got a real degree of safety because uh, we were picking up small arms fire all the time. We'd every, at least once or twice a week, we'd have a little bullet hole in the plane and we'd just cut out a piece of duct tape and stick on it and move on. 
Uh, you look inside, make sure it didn't hit a cable and, or, a, or a fuel line, you're good. This is a picture that I got out of a book. It's a B-26 built by Douglas Aircraft in Long Beach and Fort Worth, Texas. And this was an incredibly successful air airplane in Korea. We were directing them into a target and we talked them for maybe 20 or 30 minutes to get them to the right place because they were about six hills down the way looking for the target and couldn't find it. So then they finally, fire control asked us to, to come, they'd come down to our frequency and ask us to talk them into the target. And we did, we talked them into the target, which was the railroad center two hills over from where the fighting was. And it was a risky trip from my point of view because we couldn't glide home from there. We couldn't, we were well within the range of our guns and not a good place. But these B-26s were incredible. They came in and they nailed that railroad yard. And those are explosions. This was taken with our camera. Jerry McDonald had the film, uh, but those are railroad tracks. And there was a train on there, and with those secondary explosions, those trains were full of ammunition. And we just saved millions of lives, I think. It was just one of these lucky days when everything just worked. Anyway, our typical day was we'd get up at four and we'd go down to get something to eat over at the Triple Nickel, which had food. Uh, and it was a 40th, but we're 45th, but either way. Uh, we would then head down to the Combat Information Center and there'd be an officer there with something and he'd have a bunch of pictures taken the day before. And we'd, he'd show them us, he'd show us a map and he'd show us the pictures and he'd show, hey, we wanna see what's going on there. It looks like there's some digging or something here and, and whatever that thing is, we don't know what it is, find that out. And they're putting up sandbags over there, see what's cooking. And uh, then we would uh, uh, get an overlay and we had a new overlay every day. And it was a piece of film, they actually took a picture of, they draw the overlay, took a picture of it and developed a piece of film and it was 12 by 12 inches. And we had our maps were 12 by 12, we folded them. We had a, a, a lap board, a clipboard, and we'd put our map on it and we'd fold it 12 by 12. And our zone of interest was about 20 miles wide and about 20 miles deep. So we had a relatively small area and we'd, we'd get to know it so well because we flew literally every day. We got to know it so well that every time somebody moved a rock, we knew it. And this overlay would lay on top of the map and it would have numbers across the top, numbers down the side, and each square then on the map would be a location. And that's how we communicated. And we'd get the new overlay every day. Now it may have been an overlay that we had three weeks ago we recycled, but either way it was every day it changed. And other people had that overlay too, our artillery guys, everybody else had it. So we could call coordinates on the map uh, and nobody else could tell what they were because the numbers meant nothing to anyone. Anyway, we'd then go down to the airplane, we'd have to hustle, we'd go to the trailer. We usually would get, a, get our parachute once a week and we kept it during the week. You'd get it out of it, they had a trailer where we'd pick up our parachutes. And we'd uh, head down to the airplane and we'd have to mess around with it because it was never full of fuel. and. There, was, there were three guys assigned to us, and our unit was four airplanes. Uh, and it was basically uh, Pete Rems, uh, Jerry McDonald, Al Hebel, and myself. And we, we r stayed together in, in the same tent and uh, spent all our time together. We would, one day I'd be uh, the artillery officer, the next day I'd be the pilot, or vice versa, whatever anybody wanted to do. The pilot's job was actually pretty boring. The artillery officer's was a heck of a lot more fun. And, and I can tell you, I got a real high out of blowing up those trains. It was, it was really something. That was a typical day. You'd work through your fuel and you'd get the airplane and then you'd try to be up over the area before daybreak. Because if the few roads that were there, you had a chance to catch somebody. Like that F-80 that we just saw, or P-80. The idea in the morning at first light is you'd see two trucks run together or a truck with a hood open and, and there, those, those were targets and we could shoot those and that was, that was, that was fun. We, it, it didn't take very long before we could nail them on about the second shot. They only ran the trucks on the road in the middle of the night. Uh, we totally controlled the air. There's only one time in my entire time in Korea that I ever saw an enemy airplane. Uh, other than in the middle of the night when they would come over and throw hand grenades out of the plane and uh, just to get us out of bed and get us down in the slit trenches or something. Uh, we called him Bed Check Charlie and he was a pain in the neck. This particular picture, when we moved to Seoul, we were camped out in the uh, racetrack and uh, one night it was raining and miserable and uh, 
there's a guy down at the gate and says he wants to talk to some pilots. He wants in. And he's uh, soaking wet. He just he drove up in an open Jeep from Osan. And he got the ride in the Jeep, and they dropped him off, and the Jeep kept going. So he was standing there at the gate, uh, soaking wet. And I mean, he was soaked to the skin and just, he looked like he was half dead. And uh, nobody wanted to get out of the damn gate because it's a half, quarter of a mile, half a mile down the way. So anyway, I went down to the gate, and there was a guy, and it was Jimmy Jabera. And that probably doesn't mean anything, but to us it did. Uh, he was a five-time ace in Korea at the beginning, and his first, and he was back for his second tour of duty. And he'd been up ordered for his second tour to K-14, which was Kempo, which was the other side of town. And they, but he'd gotten the ride to this side of town. The racetrack was uh, on the east side of town. Kempo was on the west side of town. Well, he was 20 miles away. Nobody wanted to take him to Kempo. We brought him in, got him dried off. And, and we finally figured out who he was when he, when he took off all his, off his uh, overcoats, the rain thing, a poncho. And uh, they, uh, he went on to become an ace again in his second tour. Uh, I think he had 12 MiGs killed. Jimmy Jabera later, we were flying the same direction he is, and we had found some artillery pieces that had been moved in the night before. These guys were out of uh, Kempo, K-14, and they were headed up to MiG Alley, and they were intercepted by the Combat Information Center and directed to us to direct them to the, uh, to the artillery pieces that we'd spotted. They looked like 105 millimeters, but it's kind of hard to tell. Chinese artillery has got a shorter barrel, and it's a funny-looking machine. Uh, but it's uh, pretty damn good, they, they, and they were pretty good shots with it. These guys uh, came past us and turned in. We were flying toward it, and we were pointing it out to them, and they came right alongside because they couldn't see it. Even though we could see it, they couldn't spot it. And finally, they did spot it, and this is when they turned. And that was Jimmy in the uh, right, the upper airplane. This is another case where, where we were doing something that we were not really supposed to be doing. We were uh, assisting the Air Force. This is the Navy. The plane here, you see a plane in the top? That's an F-2H Banshee, and it came off the carrier Philippine Sea. There were two of them. Uh, there's another one right behind him that's still behind me. The target was that bridge. We'd blown it up before. We'd blown it up three or four times, in fact. And uh, son of a gun, there we were up there looking around, and there's back that has a bridge again. So we decided we'd do something about it. They, uh, we didn't decide anything. Command Center decided that we'd do something about it. Uh, we took orders. We didn't do anything. Uh, we did not have the opportunity to look for targets of opportunity. We had. We'd find a target, we had to call in and get permission to fire or commission to do something. Not like the Air Force, which had uh, Corsairs, and the Marines had Corsairs, which would go out and look around for targets of opportunity. And if they found it, they had the authority to shoot. Uh, we did not. We did not have any authority to do anything without permission. This plane dove in behind me and went under me and uh, dropped a bomb. And there's a bomb right here, and there's another bomb right there. Both those bombs hit the bridge. So this guy was good. Uh, he pulled up in front of me then, climbing out, and the second pilot was maybe just maybe uh, less than a half a minute behind him. And he was looking for the bridge, and he said, <laughs> we can't tell you where it is. The whole area, this big around, was all explosion and dust and dirt and everything in the sky. We couldn't see anything. It just, everything blew up. But he went in behind him and dropped his bombs too. And the bridge was gone the next day when we came out. We did a lot of leaflet dropping. We did it around the, the demilitarized zone or the combat area. The Air Force, uh, using uh, T-6s, were tossing leaflets out north of where we were, uh, up all the way up to the Yellow River. This is a typical leaflet. It says uh, you'll be given food and shelter and clothing and we won't shoot you. And the Chinese had been told that if we captured them, we would torture them and kill them. And they believed it, I think. Uh, and in some cases, this actually is true. This is what Bloody Ridge looked like, or actually that whole area, uh, after we fought over it a few times. This was all covered with trees when the war started. But we blew it up and bombed it and it did everything to it so much that the trees are all gone. We literally destroyed all the trees. Uh, we have at present here a fellow who was a ground controller in that they hold up your hand. You come up, let me introduce you. This is where you were. 
This is Dave Hawkins. He was a forward fire controller. Come on over and tell us a little bit about your background there. Where You were there at the beginning of the war. We landed uh, during the Pusan perimeter on the 15th of August, 1950, and fired our first missions on the 22nd of August, 1950. And from that point on until we got to the Yalu River or within close proximity of the Yalu River, we were on the move. And as I say in their infinite wisdom, I was attached with, and the S2, and he whined a lot about that too, uh, to the TAC Air unit, which was, uh, uh, had started in the Second World War to where forward observers were sent up to work with the Air Force. The Air Force had a Jeep with a pilot in it and a forward observer, uh, and they were in contact with the Mosquitoes, the T6 Texans. And I had uh, my little Jeep with a SCR 608 and a uh, 606 and a, and a 619, and I could talk to our uh, L5s. We didn't have bird dogs. We had little L5s, and I could talk to the fire direction center. So, as he told you, Korea was, there was only two levels in Korea, straight up or straight down, nothing flat. So sometimes we would have, when the infantry had issues to where they couldn't move, and by this time we had started moving north. We were moving every day. The North Koreans were on the run. But when we, uh, would, they would run into an issue, then they would call us, and we worked as a kind of a detached unit. We had uh, the Air Force Jeep, my Jeep, and a company of our infantry, and we had a M24 tank with a, a twin 40 on it and a half track with quad 50s and they kind of was our support. So we'd go up to where they were having issues and the bird dog or the mosquito would go around and say, well, oh, we can't get to it. Uh, the terrain's too steep, we can't, uh, we, we can't, there's no lines to go down, firing gun lines. So we would have our liaison come in and then we would try to register artillery strikes on it which uh, worked very well. And that uh, my career uh, as an active soldier ended uh, November the 30th when the uh, Chinese came across the Yellow River. And uh, we were overrun uh, actually two days later. We were trying to get back and got caught on the MSL and, uh, and uh, it went from bad to really bad. And I spent the next uh, three years as a uh, as a very unwilling uh, guest of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. So that was, uh, that was kind of my story. <laughs> when you uh, get up to the real front, uh, you realize that being a pilot is a pretty good job. And the, you know, it, it rained a lot and the trenches were always mud, it wasn't dirt, and, and everything was dirty and you, even a, even a sea ration, you open it up and it had dirt in it by the time you got it to where you could eat it. Uh, it, it just, and it was cold and it was miserable and everything about it is miserable. And you realize where the real heroes are in this whole battle over here and the whole Korean thing and I'm not one of them. It, it becomes very, very uh, apparent when you get there. Uh, I think they sent us up there as a wake up call because uh, as a second lieutenant, you tend to get a little on the cocky side around the place too. And we were, uh, we, we thought we, we owned the world. This is the 45th Division, the Oklahoma Group. Uh, these guys are from Hominy, Oklahoma, which is north of Oklahoma City. Uh, I went up and I spent about a, a full day with them. Uh, that's a Marine aircraft coming across, and he makes a direct hit on a strong point of some sort. It was probably a mortar outfit, uh, because they had a lot of mortars. Uh, it was a very effective weapon for the Chinese. They could carry it. Uh, the other, more Chinese could carry the more, the weapon, it didn't require trucks, it didn't require anything. They, they were really into mortars. See his antenna here. They're a signal core radio mailed, built by uh, Allied Signal. We called them command sets. They were made of aluminum. They used them in airplanes and they used them on uh, the ground. They used them everywhere. These are 45th Division guys too. Uh, and this is just cold and miserable and not a hell of a lot going on. And if you look at him, he's got a coffee grinder. He cranks that is the generator to run the radio. Now, it gives you an idea how antiquated some of this equipment was. Uh, this is all left over from World War II. Here is a different outfit on the same point. This is what we call Pork Chop Hill. Pork Chop because it had a point down at one end of it, and the Chinese wanted that point. 
and we wanted to keep it, I guess, uh, although there was no real value to it. And after fighting over it for about three months, uh, the U.S. abandoned it and let the Chinese have it because at that time we thought that the armistice would be signed and this was all academic and let's not fight over it, you know, let's get on with the world. But the important thing here is that this group had just come over the top of this hill and there is a tank right there. And that tank had us all cold. If they were alert and watching and saw us and reacted quick enough, they could kill all of us. Uh, but they weren't. And we were right this side of the hill, perhaps 150 yards from where those guys were standing, was a 45th Division 105 millimeter howitzer. And it fired three rounds into that tank and hit one dead on. A tank is a hard thing to kill with a piece of artillery because you have to hit it. You can't hit next door to it or close. If it's a truck or if it's individuals, a, a troops, or even a, even a, uh, a, a, a bunker, you can blow it down, but a tank will take the, take the hit, shake itself up, and maybe you can blow the tread off of it if you can't quite hit it, but you gotta hit it just right dead on to kill it. These guys hit it dead on, on the third shot. This is kind of funny. We were in the middle of a semi-firefight. There was lots of activity on the other side of the line. Nobody was invading anybody, but there were company strength probes going on. Uh, by that, I mean 200, 250, uh, Chinese would be creeping around uh, below our positions, uh, positioning themselves, and down next to us at the British sector. On our right, east of us, was the British sector. And we used to go over there because their food was fantastic. And they had booze. They had gin. And it, the rumor was that they had, on the, on the HMS Manchester, which was a, I don't know what it was, some kind of ship, because uh, there was a USS Manchester, which was a cruiser, and it was around too. Uh, but the HMS Manchester uh, had a still in the engine room and was manufacturing gin, and they said they had a, a, a brewmaster right out of the beef eater company that had been recruited or drafted or volunteered with a gun in his back to uh, brew gin on the boat. And it was a big deal to go somehow or other to get some of that. And we, we, made, we worked our way over there fairly, fairly regularly. Anyway, there was enemy troop activity in the in the in the in the in the in the theater and they everybody all the officers and all the units all came down to the uh, this is just outside of Seoul uh, to their British camp it was about 30 40 it was just north of just it's about 25 miles east of Seoul is the British headquarters. And uh, their general headquarters was quite close to the front compared to ours. Ours, Osan, was 150 miles from the front. Theirs was like 20 miles from the front, their general headquarters. And they had their senior staff, everybody was there. Well, what do you know, they called the war to a halt. They said, hey, time out. We've got to have a memorial service for the king. The king had died. And what do you know, all the officers in all the units, New Zealand, Canadian, all of them showed up for a memorial service. And if you look at it, they got a piano. They got a priest. This is the damnedest thing you could imagine because we're sitting here with guys uh, 20 miles away work, walking in our direction to wanting to kill us. And, and they, they just shut down and had this memorial ceremony. We had to go over to see it because we heard it coming down and we didn't believe it. The positioning of the war at that time was to get the most amount of ground. When they call the cruise, that would be the line. And therefore, if we capture it now, we get to keep it. And they were looking for weak points in our line all the time. But it wasn't no, there were no huge attacks, no big uh, massive artillery barrages. Everything was kind of quiet. And so they transferred me over to a new place called Hohensong, which was a, a K-46 airport. It was over on the east side of the uh, peninsula. And our job was to patrol that east coast and help the Navy because there was a tremendous amount of activity along that coast by the North Koreans or Chinese. They would have fishing boats, and the Navy would watch the fishing boats, and all of a sudden they were monitoring the radio frequencies, and they'd hear it transmitting, and say, ha, ah, that sucker's got a transmitter on it, and they'd blow it up. But there wasn't just one fishing boat. There were probably hundreds of fishing boats, uh, maybe even thousands. I mean, you, you, you couldn't believe the number, and you, you're, we're talking about 230 mile stretch from the demilitarized zone up to China. And these boats were anywhere from uh, a mile offshore to 
20 miles offshore, all over the place. And it, it, it's kind of hard to believe. So they asked us to come out and help them because they had planes off the carriers looking for them too. We were all looking for them. And uh, they would spot one and they'd send a destroyer escort or a destroyer over and blow it up. This is coming up on the fleet. Uh, my job was to drop on this particular flight to drop a uh, pouch with the overlays in it. And the overlays are numbered, so we could tell them we'll be on overlay number such and such. And they, in turn, would pull that out of the pouch and read it. And the idea was to come up on the Philippine Sea, drop it on the deck. And uh, so we came up on the Philippine Sea, dropped it on the deck, it bounced twice and went right out in the water. <laughs> and, uh, but they did put down a boat and retrieved it. And uh, so it worked out. Uh, the, uh, they sent us back the next day with another pouch and to drop on them. Uh, and what do you know, <laughs> it went in the water too. Uh, it's not as easy as it seems. A boat's going about 20 miles an hour and we're going about 100. In that task force, there were probably 50 ships, all big. Patrolling that coast was, was kind of neat because there were a lot of targets, more targets there to shoot at than there were on the land. And the Navy didn't have the restrictions on ammunition that the Ar Army had. One day we were patrolling uh, just after daybreak, uh, about uh, 180 miles north of the demilitarized zone and another 60 miles roughly from China. And uh, the, we got a firing order uh, target request uh, from, the, from the ship's command. And we said, well, we don't see anything out here. There's nothing to shoot at. Uh, it was one of those days we were about a mile offshore, maybe half a mile offshore, and because that's healthy. You, nobody around in the water to shoot at you when you're a mile offshore. We were probably 10,000 feet in the air, two miles up. And uh, so we could see 10 miles inland easy, and there was just nothing out there to shoot. Uh, it was one of those days. Uh, we. Uh, looked around and there was, uh, they said, well, we need a target. We want to, we want to fire a gun. We, want to, we need a target. Give us a target. He said, well, there aren't any targets. I'm sorry. There's nothing here to shoot at. He says, well, there's something out there, Lieutenant. You can find it. And uh, he says, we have a bunch of, we have a congressional party on board and we want to shoot the guns for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, <laughs> there's nobody here. <laughs> There's two peasants down there with a push cart. He says, Lieutenant, that's a target. We want the coordinates. We thought, oh crap, if we blow up a bunch of civilians, we'll get court-martialed. Uh, what the hell do we do? So we added 1,000 yards to the, to the target and gave them the coordinate. And they fired them. And we were 20 miles anyway from the ship because the ship was out of sight over the, over the horizon. And you could see the red glow on the horizon. And we thought, holy crap. And you could actually see two of the bullets or the projectiles flying in the air and they went over and they went down into that into a hill and the whole damn hill blew up the 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 had by the wildest imagination the Chinese had been running ammunition down that railroad track that we were trying to catch a train on run right on the beach all the way down they have a track and they'd offload it and carry it over and hide it inside this hill and they'd hollowed out the whole damn hill the, the uh, thing blew, we were at 10,000 feet. The debris w came up to our altitude and was still going up. And in one case, there was a tree that was, perhaps the trunk was this big around. And it had roots hanging out the bottom and leaves on the top. And they'd obviously hollowed out to where they intercepted the roots. So it was a weak point, like, like the cork in a barrel. And it blasted up and it went by us and kept on going. It, it, it probably went to 15 or even 20,000 feet. And the shock wave hit us so hard that the plastic Bakelite microphone hook broke, the, uh, knocked my glasses off, knocked, uh, we, we just, it just knocked the airplane just all over the place. We were worried that it might come apart. It was that violent. Uh, needless to say, we saw that coming and we immediately turned to, so it would be to our tail and not broadside to the wings. Uh, to the shock wave, but either way, uh, we weren't able to turn fast enough or do it. It just blew the whole damn thing up. We were directed back to Osan, which was the general headquarters, for new orders, because we were pulled off of that site. And we went down to uh, Osan to get our orders. And what do you know, uh, Eisenhower had come in that morning. 
He'd flown in in a DC-3 from Japan, and he'd flown on United Airlines to Japan. And he had been elected president, but he had not yet taken office. He brought a, a crew of one with him. Uh, one guy, and that's the master sergeant sitting here. His son, uh, Major Eisenhower, was part of the uh, command staff at Osan, and uh, he, the son joined him later. Uh, but by the time the son showed up, I w we were already gone. Uh, he was up in, the son was up in Seoul when he came in. Nobody knew he was going to be there. He just showed up that day. And there he is sitting there eating a, a, a chow like the rest of us. Uh, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> we got new stuff here. This is something that we did not have before. See, this is a flak jacket. What it is is two layers of canvas sewed with pieces of steel, little steel plates fitted in them, separate plates. Uh, and we did not have that prior. Our fight suits were a pair of pants and a shirt and a field jacket. And the field jacket was either a lightweight field jacket or a medium weight field jacket. We'd given away most of our medium weight field jackets to the poor 40th guys, so all we had were lightweight jackets. This was a big, big thing. Uh, also, his carbine is the gun that we carried in the airplane on a regular basis. Uh, we did not have sidearms, 45s and that sort of stuff. Uh, it's just as well, because I don't think I could have hit anything with them anyway. Anyway, we went back to, uh, to uh, the racetrack at, at Seoul, and we were at the racetrack for uh, about uh, two months, almost three months. And one night, uh, we routine patrols, not a lot of action on the field, not anything new digging, nobody, no, the rocks didn't move, everything was pretty cool. Uh, a lot of probing at night with 200-man uh, patrols uh, by us and by them. Uh, but there's so damn many hills and so many valleys and everything that you could go, you could pass within 200 yards of each other and not know that they're there. Uh, I didn't do any of that sort of thing. We, that's one of the advantages of being a pilot. The uh, one night, at about four in the morning on March 22nd, I think the day is, I've got to remember a little bit. I am not too accurate on the dates, but I, March 20th something. Uh, woke up at four o'clock in the morning and our 155 millimeters were firing at will. Well, you never fired at will. Uh, even when they had mass charges with Chinese all over the place, you'd fire around and you could kill on these mass charges that the Chinese did, you could set the guns up so they fired about 200 yards apart, the shell impact, and you could literally run, the, Ch the Chinese would run in there, you'd fire around, it'd just clear them out like crop circles, you see them in the, in, the, in the Midwest. They'd kill everything in those zones. Then 10 minutes later, fill up with people again. You'd fire them again, and they'd fill up with people, and you'd fire them again, and you'd do that. But we never fired, and then as fast as you could reload, fire again, and as fast as you could reload, fire again. And in doing this, they were walking them about 100 yards around. So they started literally at the bottom of our hill and went 100 yards apart all the way back across the valley. We rolled out of bed at 4 o'clock in the morning and headed down to uh, Pete Rems, uh, took off in an L-19. And uh, the night takeoff is kind of interesting. You had a barrel and you put some gas in it and you lit it at the end of the runway. And you'd line up on it with your directional gyro and you'd open the throttle and the airplane got off so quick it wasn't really a big, it wasn't as hazardous as, as it sounds because the airplane would be airborne in, in 300, 400 feet. Uh, Pete Rems took off and headed and we headed down to Combat Information Center to find out what, 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 what are we supposed to do and what's going on. And driving down there we went by our guns and these are our guns firing. This is the 402nd Field Artillery and this is the 40th Division, but the combined, uh, the composite division became a 40th Division, and these are our guns. In any event, uh, the Chinese made a major attack that, uh, that night. Uh, Pete went down and flew over the area and fired flares, and the flares could let everybody spot what was going on and direct, help us direct our fire uh, and, uh, and, and zero in on what we were doing, and we, we, we just killed literally thousands of people that day. But they also did the same thing. They came up and actually overran our positions at the top of the hill. And this is Heartbreak Ridge. And came down the backside of it. They captured the 555 triple nickel 105 millimeter guns. The guys all bugged out, headed south. Our guns, they came right up to this position. And our guns are simple. You start the engine and you drive out of there. The 105s, you had to find a truck and you had to get it hooked up and then you had to get it out of there. So most of the guns were lost. 
and they were lost so quickly that they didn't even spike them. They didn't even put uh, hand grenades in the breach and fire them off. They, they, they actually lost the guns. The Chinese turned them around and used up their remaining ammunition shooting at us. Uh, it was a bad night. Uh, the, uh, by the time the uh, end of the day, we est it was estimated that we'd kill 12,000 Chinese. Uh, the interesting thing about it was then everything quieted down. And uh, we were on the phone up to the, all the time down at Command Information Center, and the, we were out looking around. And the interesting thing happened. The, they decided they would have a ceasefire for two days for them to recover their bodies. And we could recover ours. It was sort of a mutual understanding. And uh, the, uh, we recovered ours very quickly because uh, they were all on our side of the line. Uh, but they had theirs scattered all over the hills. And interestingly, they, they went down and they stripped them of their clothes and the bags and their arms and left the body. They didn't recover their dead. And they, uh, three, four, five days later, the entire area smelled of decaying bodies. Because uh, this whole valley was just kind of a little cup there between the hills. and it. it to, uh, they estimated 12,000 people dead in that valley, and they didn't recover their people, which is a surprise to me. It, it's not incompatible with our way of thinking. In any event, uh, about four days later, when there was still lots of activity going on, uh, I went out and was flying with, uh, I was a pilot, Ed Hebel was the controller, and we were looking for targets. And we were looking all over these dead bodies all over the place, and well, they're not picking them up, but what's going on? And uh, about that time, uh, we saw two flashes in the sky. We didn't see any airplane, just a flash, like an like a, like a anti-aircraft shell went off. But then we, the binoculars, you look, and uh, there were four airplanes uh, that came in. We think they came in off the Bonhomme Richard, not the Philippine Sea. And they think they were Phantoms, uh, the F9Fs. And two MiGs had jumped them and shot both, two, and got two of them in the first pass. And uh, the other two turned and headed out to sea immediately. And the uh, remaining uh, two MiGs looked around and one of them stayed up high. They were probably 20,000 feet or more when, they, when this was happening. And uh, one of them circled, came over and circled, came down by us, we were at 10. And he came right up beside me, right from here to that wall away. And he looked at me and I looked at him and we said, oh shit. And uh, then he turned and we left. So I figured we're out of here, he's gone. And then I saw him turn back and then I figured we we're in trouble. So we started a tight spiral and we, we spiraled down to about 20 feet off the ground and headed south. And as fast as our little wings would carry us. And we made it uh, probably three quarters of the way to the safe zone. We were probably a mile and a half short, short of the, the safe zone is what we considered it. Uh, we crested a hill and uh, at about 20 feet and a, a mortar. We were still on the bad guy's side and they'd fired a mortar at some other target somewhere else and it went through our right wing about four feet from the wingtip. And it just punched a hole right through the wing, went right on up, did not set off until it was 30 or 40 or 50 feet above us. The, we think we were so low that it did not have time to arm and otherwise it would have exploded on contact. Uh, but it went up 40, 50 feet above us and blew. And it came back and shattered the whole airplane with little pieces of metal. And I got hit really hard right here in the chest and that flak fist saved my life. Uh, and it hit my left leg and it, it busted it, or actually it shot some holes in it. Uh, we uh, basically crested another hill, pushed the nose down and, and b b bounced along on the uh, in the valley of the little hill, which is sort of a draw because when it rains, everything runs to those little straws and goes. And uh, we stopped and uh, Ed Hebel, my, my controller at that time, had a piece of metal right through his neck and he was dead. And I jumped out and put a hand grenade on the seat and ran like hell down the hill. Down the hill. And then finally it was obvious I couldn't get out of there. So I crawled up in the side and, uh, of the draw and hid in the weeds. And I crawled into those weeds so tight you couldn't believe it. And uh, I stayed there for probably a day and a half and I'd see guys walking up and down the hill and I could look down and I could see their feet but I couldn't see the people. And the, uh, 
you'd look at them and they'd have canvas stripes like our half tents cut up in strips and wound around their feet for shoes. So I figured those aren't my guys. And then pretty soon a group came along with combat boots on and they were kind of strange because they were hollering and screaming and making all kinds of noise and, and you'd think they'd be creeping along stealthily. Not the case. They made all kinds of noise. They were shouting. It, it's just unreal because you know all around us there were bad guys. Uh, the guy that fired the mortar could not be more than 100 yards from where I was at. And that means there were more than just one troop up there. Uh, but I uh, hollered at them and rolled out and uh, it was a group of turkeys, soldiers, on patrol. And they looked at me and they didn't know quite what to think and we talked a little bit and finally a little broken English we got by and, and we had the, the, the Thunderbird patch, patch, you know, American, American, you know. And uh, they decided I was okay and they stopped. And, uh, but they weren't gonna go back, take me back. They, I had to go with them on the rest of their tour. I could stay there. I didn't want to stay there. <laughs> So I went with them on the rest of the tour and they took a brand, they had all had oh, sorry, that long a sword. And every time they'd stop for a break, out come the sword and they'd sharpen that sucker. They needed, it couldn't need sharpening, they sharpened it 15 minutes ago, but they were sharpening it again. They were into that thing. And uh, we, uh, uh, they took a tree and whack whack and made a little crutch for me. And I walked around the rest of the thing with them and back to the troops and then I was uh, taken from there. Well, let's see, we wound up at their command post. And this is the Turkish command post. And we crossed up there and crossed into their lines. And that is their lines. If you look, he's got a 50 caliber machine gun there looking out. Uh, and there, they uh, transferred me from there to a hospital ship uh, that was in the Unchun Harbor and then on to Clark Air Force Base and then finally back to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma uh, to their veterans hospital. And that's kind of the story of my military career. That is the end, but maybe not quite, because uh, I still have an airplane. I still fly it regularly. Uh, I'm 80 years old this year, and uh, last year I flew more than 300 kids, uh, more than 100 separate flights of uh, young Eagle kids on uh, free airplane rides for them and things like that. And it's a fun, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, that's sort of my story. That's it. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.